Hi, everyone. Um, I think we should get started. We have a very, very big hour ahead of us. Um, welcome. My name is Samantha McCann. I am the network curator at the Solutions Journalism Network. And um, today we are going to be talking about the Editor's Toolkit, which is um, a resource that we released yesterday. Uh, first, I wanted to give you a few updates on, on where the network is. Um, we've, we've launched a couple of really big projects in the last month with the Boston Globe and the Detroit Free Press, uh, reporting on solutions to and violence uh, in Detroit and with the Boston Globe, solutions to public education, the challenges in public education. So those are two, they're going to be really great projects. Um, there's more on our website if you want to check out more behind them. Also, we are uh, in the process of seeking a education director. Um, so there's more details about that on our site as well. And one more detail. Pop Tech. We are sponsoring one journalist to go to Pop Tech, which is, is this fantastic conference in Maine um, in October. And we want a smart, curious, fun journalist to go and write about all the awesome solutions that, um, that are being talked about in, in education, environment, crime, uh, technology, everything. So you can apply for that on our site. Um, and let's get started. So today I want to introduce um, Rika Rani. Rika is SJN's Intelligence Director. Um, she works to identify and distill best practices from across the new, uh, network's newsroom collaborations. So she's our, our numbers lady. She tells us what to do and what not to do. <laughs> Rika holds um, a master's degree from Columbia University's School of International and Public Affairs, where she studied media and communications and economic development. She has also served as editor-in-chief for the Journal of International Affairs. And you can find her on Twitter. It's at Rick Rani, R-I-K-R-A-N-I. -I. So welcome, Ricka. Um, and we are also um, have as a guest Greg Borowski. Greg is the deputy managing editor for projects, investigations, and digital innovation at the Milwaukee Journal where he has overseen projects that have won the Pulitzer, the George Polk Award, and the Gerald Loeb Award, as well as uh, awards from IRE, SPJ, ONA, ASNE, and so many more. Um, really excited to have him here. Greg spent almost 20 years as a reporter before becoming an editor, so he really knows both sides of the issue. Um, he's also written nonfiction and fiction books alike, and um, his hashtag on Twitter is at Greg J. Borowski. Um, and I'll put those up in the, in the chat section so everyone can, can follow along and um, follow them on Twitter. Um, so welcome again. Um, I would like to pass it over to Ricka. She is the lead author of the Editor's Toolkit. And Ricka, tell us a little bit about kind of the theoretical underpinnings behind this toolkit. Sure. Um, thank you so much, Sam. And hello, everybody. We're really excited. We, as Sam mentioned, launched our kit yesterday. And um, so we're really excited to talk about it and, and tell you about some of what's in it. Um, so why did we produce this toolkit? Some of you may know that we launched a solutions journalism toolkit earlier in the year. That toolkit was a step-by-step -step guide to producing solutions journalism. It walked through the process of finding solutions-oriented stories, conceptualizing the stories, writing them, recording them, promoting them, um, so really from the first step to the last. It was giving journalists um, tools and the skills to do really top-notch solutions journalism. Through our work, we have found that as the most skilled journalist and the most enthusiastic solutions journalism enthusiast um, still requires some infrastructure around them, particularly if they're working in a newsroom. So um, enthusiasm alone isn't enough to sustain this practice in a newsroom. So we produced this toolkit as a guide for editors who are interested in bringing this practice into their coverage. 
to give them some strategies for how to do that. And a lot of this is really about organizational change, and that sounds like a very sort of business textbooky term, but really newsrooms are organizations, and whenever an organization is instituting change, uh, there are some challenges. And we wanted to produce this toolkit to really try and get at those challenges and, and give editors some really concrete, tangible strategies for how to do this. Great. And I will post uh, a link in the chat for everyone if you haven't downloaded the kits. You can follow along on your own computer, zoom in if you can't quite see it well on the webinar platform. Um, but we're going to dive in and look at the SOJO Diagnostic, which is on which page, Rika? Uh, it's on page 10, but before we dive in there, I just wanted to give people an overview of the kit. That's all right? Perfect. Just so they have a sense or what they can find in here. Um, and I'll do that really quickly so we can dive right into the content. Um, so here's just a quick overview of the kit. We talked a little bit about what solutions journalism is um, and what it is not. Um, we have a section on why solutions journalism, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later and why it's important for editors to be able to articulate why solutions journalism is a practice that is worth incorporating into the newsroom's coverage. Uh, then we have a, a diagnostic, which I'll talk more about in just a minute. Um, some tips that, that editors can use uh, in the newsroom to get this uh, practice embedded. Uh, we have a section on audience engagement. We have a few stories at the end that are annotated that uh, we try to show sort of the types of things that editors can look for in these types of stories. Um, and then a little bit of information about, about Solutions Journalism Network. Uh, throughout the toolkit, we have uh, advice from editors. We surveyed over a dozen as editors. We work with uh, over 40 newsrooms around the country. And throughout this toolkit, we try to disperse their words of wisdom um, about various aspects of the practice of solutions journalism. So with that, let's go to the solutions journalism diagnostic. So we're focusing today on a few sessions of the toolkit, um, and, and uh, hopefully um, you'll be able to walk away with some, some, some concrete ideas for how um, you as a journalist can, can start to adopt this practice into your work, um, or um, if you're an editor, how you can bring this into the newsroom more broadly. Rika, let me interrupt for one second here. Um, for anyone who didn't join us for our last webinar a month ago, it was um, it was introducing everyone to kind of the, the core, the main ideas of solutions journalism. Um, and unfortunately, we had a corrupted recording, and so we didn't post that on our site. But we are recording this as well if you want to share this afterwards or go back to it and review a part again. Um, and also, there is a, there should be a question section in your control panel. And if you have any questions for any of the panelists up here, just send them along, and I will make sure to ask them. Okay. Thanks, Rika. No problem. Okay, so the Solutions Journalism Diagnostic. What is this and why do we need a diagnostic? What this is essentially is just a series of questions that we uh, recommend that editors reflect upon when thinking about uh, expanding their coverage to include solutions. So these, types of, these questions get at things like what is the mission of your newsroom, what are you trying to accomplish with, with your journalism? And can solutions journalism advance that mission? Is it consistent with what you're trying to achieve with the news that you're putting out there? Uh, what uh, beats or topics um, do you cover or do you prioritize? And do you feel that for those particular beats or topics, solutions journalism is needed? Is there a gap between awareness of the problem and credible responses to that problem. Um, so what do I mean by that? Um, if you were thinking about an issue like, for example, community policing, would you be able to say one response to that problem of police relations with minority communities in particular? That's a big story these days. But most of us probably couldn't um, even say one, one 
response to that problem. And so I would say that for that issue, there's a gap between awareness of the problem and knowledge about responses to that problem. And so there are some opportunities there, I think, to come at that issue from a different perspective. Sure. Is influencing or improving the quality of public discourse or policy without advocating for specific policies or practices an important part of your mission? So is that something that, that you, you want your news coverage to accomplish, to, to change the way that people are talking about an issue or to reach policymakers and really inform the policies that's being made at that level? And this can really start to Sorry, Erica. This can really happen at all levels, right? So you think about really large publications and how much influence they have, especially, um, you know, in, in their op-ed sections or something, that people really pay attention to those as, as how an issue is framed in the whole country, but also really small publications, really small papers that are influential in their community and have a lot of pull on bringing attention to local issues. Absolutely. Our, our network of newsroom partners ranges across the board from small community papers to large national papers to TV stations and all kinds of, across all mediums as well. Um, and so that impact, I think, is, is not limited to, uh, by size um, or by, by type of publication. Um, and Solutions Journalism, we've seen, has the, the potential to really, um, to, to inform policy. And Greg can probably speak to that um, as well, as I know that, that his paper has done some, some great solutions journalism that has really been impactful at the policy level. Um, do, want, do you want me to speak to that now? I can. Yeah, sure, that'd be great. Yeah. I mean, one example that we had in our newsroom within the last few years was our, our project called Deadly Delays, which looked at the uh, newborn screening program across the country. And this is a program where uh, whenever a baby is born, uh, they get a within 24 hours. They get a, a blood, a little prick of their heel. The blood is taken as a sample, and from that sample, uh, health officials are able to determine a whole range, you know, dozens of potential health conditions. Some of which are very easily remedied. In some cases, as simple as the diet the baby is put on. And what we discovered was that, uh, you know, we looked at every state across the country. We got data from the majority of them and found out who was the worst in terms of uh, getting into the hospitals, we also looked at it from the other perspective of who who did this well, and we found that while some states were taking you know several days or up to a week to get the samples to the lab, in, in within that time the child might die or become gravely ill. Other states were doing it extremely well, such as Iowa and Delaware, where they were getting you know 99 plus percent to the lab in time, and we really incorporated that into the, the story to say. Okay, here's our bad example, so to speak, but here's some states that are doing it, and we drove, you know, sort of past just the number to look at, you know, how are they doing it. So in Iowa, they have a courier system that visits every hospital every day, whereas in other states, they're using the U.S. Postal Service to get it there or batching the, the samples at the hospitals. And, and just the clarity that we were able to bring to the story with, the, with that sort of solution and the perspective that it can be done prompted a lot of reforms to happen very quickly because hospitals and states are able to look at it and say, well, here's our policy, and why are we, you know, batching everything? Or one hospital system was taking all of the samples from its various hospitals, bringing them to one location, and then sending them to the states. So it was a lot of, you know, silliness that was going on that could easily be remedied, and we saw very quickly states that, you know, made their changes and are now up you know, to, to, to the very top in their own percentages. And so by highlighting that, that's, that's really interesting, by highlighting what, what was working as opposed to just saying, look, this is, this is a huge problem that we face, you, your community was given like a, a path forward, a path out of it. Right, yeah, and one thing we wanted to do and we're very clear about doing is we didn't, I mean, sometimes you'll see, and even we've done this historically a little bit, so here's the solutions story at the end of a long project, and we said, no, this was, a, a very significant section of the main bar, so it was incorporated very much into the project to show, okay, not only here's where things are not working, but here's here's a way forward for people to, to improve their system. So right. by you know incorporating yeah. it, it was a different approach than we might have otherwise took, and it was easier to, we had their attention by highlighting the problem. We wanted to say, well, here's, here's the way it can easily uh, yeah. be remedied as well. 
That's great. Yeah, I think that really highlights the point that in that solutions journalism can really strengthen investigative pieces by showing that other people are doing it, and so it, it almost removes the excuses for inaction. Yeah, I certainly agree with that. I oversee all of our investigative work as well as other projects, and you know, sometimes in investigative reporting, it's easy for the reporter to stop when they've identified the problem, and you'll hear people say, "Well, no, you have to. You can't stop reporting until you've found sort of who's responsible." And this is sort of you know that next step of not just who's responsible, but where where can it be done different or better? So it really requires, I think, the reporter to push, you know, further than they might otherwise do. Even if they're in this sort of exhaustive investigative mode, that you know, you don't want that. I guess what I'm saying is you don't want that solution sort of be the afterthought of like, okay, now I've got this great project. Let me bang out a 15-inch, you know, quote-unquote solution story, which might only be a surface you know, listing of you know laws or bills or something. It should be a lot more you know, central to what they're starting out to do. Great. Um, so just to, to finish off our discussion of the diagnostic, there's a couple of other questions that editors should reflect on, I think, when, when considering um, sort of transitioning into more of this kind of journalism. And those are sort of the internal questions about, about barriers. I mean, are there things internally that might prevent the newsroom from really being able to adopt that practice? And that could be very you know, logistical things. It could be things like staffing. It could be, um, resources um, because solutions journalism is, is can be done relatively quickly I don't think it takes a lot of, of resources um, to do and journalists can start doing it right away but at the same time it does require some leadership commitment it requires um, a little bit of time as journalists start to get up to um, familiar with the practice um, and so are there barriers within the organization that are that might might stand in the way, and if so, then maybe it, it's, um, it's not the right time. Um, another question would be, are there champions in the newsroom that can really help drive this, this initiative forward? Um, and that can be an editor, it can be um, journalists within the newsroom, it can be anyone really, but somebody who is, who is excited about solutions journalism, who believes that it is something that can really add value to the newsroom and who can really help help drive the, the project forward. So that's great. So these are really just issues to kind of frame is now the time is, you know, what what will help me implement this in my newsroom? What will hinder me? Um, just being realistic about the challenges, but also being realistic about maybe when there aren't, maybe there is a champion, maybe you do have enough resources and, and can do this rather easily and you don't have any excuses anymore. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's really just these are questions that will help you set yourself up for success. Yeah. Because uh, as much as you know, people want to do this practice. What we've seen is that if it's not the right time, um, if you're you know short staffed and you're scrambling, you know, to just you know cover cover the the day to day sort of beat, um, then then it's tough to do this. And you really want to set yourself up for success. Um, and so these are questions that will help editors um, determine whether it's, it's the, the timing is right. Okay, great. So I want to keep us moving here. We have a lot more to cover, but I want to answer a few questions. Um, uh, Greg, you're you're a little quiet for some of the listeners here. I don't know if you can move up the microphone a bit. Um, maybe just hold it. Um, and someone was having trouble downloading the kit. It only seems to work in Chrome. So if you have Chrome, um, I would recommend trying that, and it seems to work. I guess Safari doesn't work. We found out last night, and um, Firefox isn't working either. But let me know if you keep having trouble um, downloading the kit, and we'll, we'll see what you can do. I'll, I'll just mail you a PDF. Um, OK, so I want to kick this off with a poll question, a little bit of trivia. What percentage of change management projects end in failure? And I'll give you about 20 seconds. Two more seconds. All right. 
70 percent well we have a bunch of pessimists on our hands that's actually right it's between 60 and 70 percent um, of change management projects that, that do end in failure um, and it really points to just how difficult this is but not impossible and I want to now get into some strategies for editors that will increase the likelihood of success. Um, and this is what we call our starter guide. Um, and, and we hope it's got some useful tips. So give me a minute because, all right. Okay. So the first strategy we have um, to talk about here is anticipate and head off misconceptions. So often, most, most of the time when we go in and do a workshop about solutions journalism, uh, people have uh, some ideas about what it is and what it isn't. Um, and some of that is right on the money and some of that uh, doesn't characterize solutions journalism. So a lot of people in hearing the name, they think it's PR, they think it's advocacy or, or good news journalism. Um, and we are usually able to very quickly um, sort of dispel some of those misconceptions about solutions journalism, uh, at least the way that we define it. Um, it's really important, I think, for editors in the newsroom to also be able to, to do that and to be able to articulate what solutions journalism is so that any sort of misconceptions or resistance that journalists might have that stem from those misconceptions can be quickly dispelled. And we have a ton of resources and tools. We have these toolkits um, that have a lot of information in them. And that's not to say that editors need to be sort of these authorities on solutions journalism. I think that's, that's why we exist. Um, but if, they're, if they are able to articulate what solutions journalism is and to counter some of the misconceptions that might emerge from within the newsroom, um, then it'll go a long way toward um, sort of, you know, making a strong case for the practice in the newsroom. Now, Greg, I want to, I'm curious if you had any resistance in your newsroom from reporters or from publishers or other, or other editors to... Yeah to kind of starting off with solutions? Yeah, I guess I wouldn't say resistance as much as maybe some skepticism. Um, it helps in our newsroom, our top editor, George Stanley, is a, a big supporter of this approach even before, you know, I, I got her 17 years ago uh, as a reporter and there was always this push or this emphasis on, well, what's, what's the best practices for that? Is there a different way to look at it? So it's sort of in, ingrained to a certain level in the newsroom, but there is some of that skepticism. I think it goes back to people not fully understanding it or saying, you know, you know that this is the best. Well, I guess, I guess some of the resistance, I think, comes in from people are worried that if they cite this program or this one effort in this place, that is it the best? perfect example is that what if in two weeks we find out that the that, that program is not really as effective as we thought or or that the board will be there'll be some scandalous spending and you know, it's sort of, sort of like people are resistant I think to put something out there as as the best solution and I think what we've done to try to get past that is to say look you know with this story or this group doesn't have to solve every part of the problem or it doesn't have to be a you know the exactly perfect pure city it's got to provide some insight to help people you know both readers and policymakers be able to move forward and and see that we can learn something from it so I'd say that's where a lot of the you know sort of the skepticism might have come from or the bit of resistance of okay if, if we're gonna put program X out there as the solution what if we find out we're wrong, <laughs> and it doesn't work, or it wouldn't work here. Then we look foolish. I mean, that's sort of the the back of the mind thing that a reporter has. You know, it's easy to highlight the problem because we've identified the problem. People can look around and see that it's an accurate, real problem. But when you say, you know, here's the real solution. I mean, you know, and, and I so that's where the resistance and skepticism comes in. That's that's a fantastic point, and one we try to emphasize a lot is that it's. 
there is no capital T, capital S, the solution. There, you know, a solution doesn't have to work 50, 50%, 100%. Um, it is just about taking these little key insights and learning how that might apply to your community or to your program. Um, and that, yeah, if you report what's happening in the moment um, and you pay attention to evidence, you, you know, you're doing your job. And if the situation changes, then, then that's fine. You just, you know, you write the follow-up story. Right. Yeah, that's what I often will talk with the reporter about. And so, well, what if, what if that solution or that thing we highlighted isn't working? Well, then we go pursue that as a story too, and maybe you keep you know, expanding the net a little bit. And so, are there other, other examples that are also worth, worth looking at? So sometimes we try not to just highlight, you know, one particular place, but to say here's a, a menu of things that are working elsewhere that will help people better understand what might be going wrong, you know, where we are here in Milwaukee. Exactly. Rebecca, you want to take it away with the second part? Yeah. So <laughs> the next strategy is being prepared to re-examine your coverage priorities. Um, and one of the things that, that we say a lot is that problems scream and solutions whisper. And what we mean by that is that Solution stories often aren't breaking news stories. So when a plane crashes or there's a, a, a disease outbreak, um, there, those stories, you know, will, they'll be in your face. You will know about those stories. Um, Solutions-oriented stories aren't typically like that. They're typically stories that, that need to be deliberately surfaced, and there needs to be some intentionality around finding them. So what does that mean for an editor? Well, it means that, it, that, that there are some questions that they may need to ask about where to invest resources. So asking the kinds of questions about that, that get to what the most relevant stories are for the audience and what's missing from the public conversation. What stories are we doing because we've just always done them? Um, so in practical terms, what that means is, you know, do you need to cover the, another school board meeting? Or would that journalist time be better spent investigating approaches to a problem in public education that might be working? So it's just sort of looking at, at, at the overall landscape of your coverage and trying to be strategic and thoughtful about, about what's missing and potentially giving up some lower value coverage so that journalists can um, invest the time that might be necessary to surface some of these responses. Um, and so we just encourage editors to, to, to reflect on that and um, to, to think about fresh ways that might be, um, they might employ um, and solutions to one of them to look at these issues in a way that they might not have done, that, done before. Seek out champions. So we talked about this one a little bit, so I won't spend a whole lot of time on it, but essentially finding people within the newsroom, ideally somebody for each desk that can ask the question, who's doing it better? Um, and, and really just trying to infuse that perspective into conversations within the newsroom. And, that, and that's really, really important. Newsrooms, you know, are busy places, and journalists are busy people, and um, it's very easy to kind of get lost in the mid, in the crush of daily deadlines, um, but if you have somebody, somebody who can um, sort of infuse the solution perspective and, ask, and, and just ask the questions, you know, is there a solution that's angled to this story, I think can go a long way in getting these stories off the ground. Definitely. Greg, are you, are you the journal's main champion there? Or is there others on the team? Well, um, I think we've got a, quite a few people who are you know, engaged in this sort of reporting, and what really makes it easier, and what we found, I think, is when you you do a couple of stories that of the taking this approach, and you see the results. It really, you know, it's sort of the proof is in the pudding for the other reporters who might be skeptical. So, I mean, think about any reporter, and in particular, like from an investigative standpoint, if you're going to spend three months or some long period chipping away at a story, you want to see results. The, the worst case is you've written your story, it's beautifully written and packaged and made your point, but then there's a big thud and nobody says, you know, hey, let's address that or fix it or investigate it or, you know, you want that result. So 
what this helps mm -hmm. do, I think, is you know it, it it shows policymakers and readers a different path to it. So, in the case of several of the stories we cited, or at least the deadly delays, and we've had others, there's massive, quick. Uh, response from elected officials and others, in part because you've taken away their ability to say, well, it's always been that way, or nobody's got their arms around this problem. So I think, you know, to, the, to your question on champions and things, everybody over time becomes a champion in a small way when they see, you know, hey, that story that Meg did had such great impact, or that story that, you know, Ellen and the Deadly Delays team Team did had the impact. It, it makes people a believer in a different way, I think, than just you know being a cheerleader kind of champion. As much as you know, you can point to real things that had a real impact, and then you know people will believe that because I mean journalists are skeptical as the next guy, of course. Yeah, yeah. That's a really great point, Anna. And I should add that that a lot of these strategies are for uh, that very early phase when, when solutions journalism is still very new and there haven't been demonstrated projects. But to Greg's point, solutions journalism I think very quickly in our experience takes off after there have been a few demonstration projects that sort of show um, what the impact can be. Um, and I think after that it, it becomes a lot easier. And so many of these strategies um, you know, are for, for you know, the very early stage. Um, and then solutions journalism as a practice tends to grow organically with new, the new term after that. Moving on to propose a story or series. When, it, when as an editor, when you're introducing solutions journalism to your, your colleagues and to the newsroom more broadly, it helps to have a, a concrete um, set of that stories or ideas. ideas for solutions journalism projects. And what that does is, is it takes solutions journalism as an abstract practice to something very concrete. So instead of having the discussion about, oh, should we be doing this, the discussion becomes, um, how about this story? And, and maybe we should look at it this way. And, um, oh, we could do this graphic with that story. And so it, it takes this very sort of abstract concept of solutions journalism and makes it very tangible. And so to the extent that that you can um, have some story ideas um, in mind that really um, can help. So one example that I that comes to mind, and it's I, I know I go on and on about Fayetteville, but um, the Fayetteville Observer is one of my favorite examples. Uh, they're a mid-sized paper. Fayetteville has a, a pretty bad crime problem, one of the highest um, property crime rates in the U.S. Um, and they had been covering crime for a long time and they wanted to do a series. The editor there, Mike Adams, he's like, you know, I want to cover, I want to cover crime, but I don't want to do it in, in the traditional way. And so he had, he had the series ready. He knew what he wanted to write about, but he just needed the frame change. And it made it really easy to kind of pitch to the publisher. He, he was the champion. He didn't have to seek out a champion because he really owned it in the newsroom and knew how he wanted to do it. He brought on an incredible reporter, but um, he had publisher support also because, uh, you know, p readers and viewers engage with either really lowbrow stuff, think kind of BuzzFeed top 10, what was happening in the 1990s with chapsticks or the really highbrow investigations, um, you know, lo looking deep into serious issues that like, that's where readers engage, but a lot of publications kind of get stuck in the middle there. And so the publisher's like, you know, I, it was a risk and it was something we had to think hard about, but you know, in the end you just kind of have to jump. And like Greg said, it was one of the most meaningful projects he's ever done in the end. And the paper won North Carolina press association, um, enterprise reporting award. Uh, it was just, it was a great success because they had the champion. They had, they knew what they wanted to do ahead of time and they, they were re-examining their coverage priorities about what, where they actually wanted to invest reporters' times and editors' times. Um, okay, so I'm going to put out another poll question. What do you think is the biggest obstacle to implementing solutions journalism in a newsroom? 
I'll give you a little time. Lack of resources, time, training, money to implement change, resistance from staff, lack of leadership commitment. Give me a couple more seconds. All right. So lack of resources and lack of leadership commitment. That's interesting. Rick, what do you think? There's no real right answer here. Um, I think it's interesting that, that nobody thought of this interim staff. I think we've definitely seen, as we talked about, you know, and Greg talked about um, some skepticism within the newsroom that uh, usually gets pretty quickly dispelled. But I do think that that can be a factor. Um, but, you know, I, I think this is, this, this is pretty right on. I mean, lack of key resources is always an issue just most of the time. Lack of leadership commitment is interesting. Um, we haven't, we tend to see, and there's sort of a selection bias here, right, because the newsrooms that we work with tend to be newsrooms who are interested in this practice and who want to, you know, who adopt and embrace it. Yeah. Um, so we tend to see leaders who, who are pretty committed. But, um, yeah, this is interesting. Greg, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think an answer like this will depend so much on what, the individual newsroom is, but I would make a couple points on the the resources. I mean, we, one thing that I mean, we're all probably in the same kind of experience of you know their staffs aren't getting bigger, our demands aren't getting smaller, but that does force you to make key choices, and this is a, a choice that you know your reporters are going to be writing stories anyway. So sometimes it's in the framing of the story if it's you know, just let's cover all of the latest uh, crime incidents and have them as isolated, you know, nine-inch boilerplate stories about so-and-so was killed on this date and this location. I mean, or that the reporter who's there will feel much more valued and much probably have a more rewarding job experience if they're looking beyond that in a more comprehensive, detailed way. So if you sort of shift that frame, um, you'll you'll still get the stories. You're just going to get get them in a more you know meaningful way and I mean the leadership commitment it's hard for me to respond to that a little bit but I think sometimes it's you know if you look up the the, the ladder of the leadership there there's so many things that everybody's doing these days so it's sometimes that may be a reflection of well the leader one day wants me to do solutions journalism and the next day is more worried about you know this kind of story and the third day is worried about you know the ed entertainment section and and so it may just be an interpretive thing of they're not, you know, that it's not the only thing they mention or which is the priority and some lack of clarity there. But I guess I would suggest that the, in the end, you know, the the once you start doing the stories, you know, it may be there's an obstacle, in, at least a mental obstacle of how do we find time to do it. But, I mean, as an editor, at some level you just want the stories to fill the paper so you know you can either get a bunch of 10 inch stories that aren't meaningful or without context and detail or you can you know invest a little more time to do it do it this way and get stories that have more impact and sometimes they create their own follow-up stories and what we found is once you you get people moving to respond to an issue well you've got a whole series of stories about implementation and does this measure get through the legislature and, and it's, it's so they create their own sort of mini beats in a way after you've highlighted the problem definitely and that makes me think of um, of our project with Seattle Times Education Lab so if you think about looking at solutions to you know to challenges in education there's, there's so much to work with there, and there's no one overarching solution, but you can really just spin off of it for a long time. We're about to enter the third year of that, and it's just had tremendous impact and success and, and really highlighting these little programs that are working in, in various aspects. All right, so let's move on to the second part of the starter guide. Up. My computer actually crashed downloading this webinar software yesterday, and so <laughs> I've been having um, some issues there. So I'm hoping that this is a value to people because uh, okay. we've been through a lot of trouble. <laughs> yes. 
three hours at the Apple Store. Yes. Um, okay, so this is the second part of our starter guide. Um, uh, look for openings, and this is similar to just finding champions, but, um, but as an editor, um, as reporters come to you with story ideas, um, look for openings to infuse the solution's perspective into that coverage. Um, you know, we say the simple question, is there a solutions angle here, can lead to a very rich discussion about different perspectives and, and potentially new angles. And so and look for those openings, um, you know, in, in, in conversations about, about coverage. Um, then, then you can help drive the solutions project forward. Set specific targets. Um, so this is a really easy way to integrate solutions into your coverage. Um, you know, one of the one of the biggest or most impactful things that an editor can do is to really is to ask the newsroom to do these kinds of stories and to, to articulate that very clearly um, and set clear goals. So one example might be to do a solution story, you know, every month or every, you know, quarter or whatever whatever the right number is. Um, it could also be in any investigation, and we touched on this um, when Greg was um, talking earlier about investigations, is just always infusing the question, who's doing it better? Um, and making that just a regular part of the investigative process. Um, sort of looking at places that are doing things better. Now, so setting specific targets, whatever that target may be, these are just a couple of examples, but whatever it is that, that makes sense um, for you is to, to just um, set those targets and articulate them so people know what the expectations are. And with that, I like quality solutions. Sorry, I was Sorry, just, specificity is really key, I think. Um, especially when you're setting goals, it's, you know, think about fitness goals. It's not just like run more. You say run three times a week. So don't just say write solutions journalism, say I'm going to do exactly like you were saying, one story a week or one story a month. It really holds you more accountable and makes it more likely to happen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it makes it easier for people to wrap their heads around. It makes it, like I said, more tangible. Um, Highlighting quality solutions reporting. So oftentimes when we do workshops, um, people intrinsically can see the value of doing this kind of journalism, especially when we talk about the impact that it can have. And we have a section in this toolkit about impact. Um, and just in our experience, we've seen solutions journalism um, change the way that audiences talk about an issue, um, inform policy, you know, do all kinds of really impactful things. And usually that, that uh, is an intrinsic driver of, of people's motivation to do solutions journalism. Um, but editors can, can create more incentives within the newsroom uh, for solutions journalism by simply rewarding the practice. And those rewards don't need to be um, you know, anything major. It can be as simple as just congratulating the reporter for a job well done, um, featuring the story, uh, you know, prominently, um, just recognizing good solutions journalism, the way you would recognize any journalism, but really um, conveying the message that, that solutions journalism is valued and um, is encouraged. Absolutely. Greg, you look like you want to say something or just hold on. Yeah, no, I thought that last point, yeah, I mean, that last point was a very valuable one because, I mean, if you think about all your reporters, you've got a newsroom of trained observers who are very good at what they do. So if they're going to observe, if you, on one hand, say, we should do more solution stories, but on the other hand, they always run inside and never make the front page, or they're going to observe that as an editor, since that's our primary audience, if the editor is only, you know, finds this great story that, you know, highlights a problem and it goes and talks to that reporter and, you know, sort of, you get that sense in the newsroom, we're really gung-ho about this story, you have to sort of, I guess, audit yourself in terms of what what you do and how, what you're emphasizing or de-emphasizing is going to be perceived in the newsroom because that gets, 
you know, that, that will get around. People are like, well, they wanted me to do this solution story, and then I couldn't get it in the newspaper. They kept holding it, and then it ran here, and no one said anything afterwards, and then that message, whether you intended it or not, is going to be, you know, we don't really like solution stories. We're just saying we do. Right. That's a great That's point. That's a great point. Um, so that's about it from the starter guide. Um, I think there's a little caveat at the bottom that we don't want to make it sound easy. There are a lot of challenges, of course, as with any kind of institutional change, but that if you really think about it and, and think about it deeply um, and really look at, pay attention to these, these key points like celebration and setting specific targets, that it's something that you can institute um, in your newsroom. And, you know, and, and I also want to add to that that, you know, we don't want to make it sound easy. We also don't want to make it sound impossible. Um, you know, we have a, the, the starter guide with strategies and, and, you know, that potentially can make it feel like it's this big thing. But this can also be done incrementally. And these strategies can be applied to, to get people over the hump for even just one story. Um, and so this this doesn't need to be this huge, you know, institutional initiative. It can be applied to, you know, four specific projects. It can, you know, so so this is this is very doable, um, and there are certainly challenges with any um, implementation of change. But um, this is, I think, something that is very very uh, feasible. Absolutely. Okay, poll time. Which of the following stories is best suited to a solutions angle? A shark attacked several people at a local beach. The achievement gap between high and low income students is growing. Or women are waiting longer to have kids than in past years. I'll give you a few seconds here. Hundred percent for the achievement gap. Wow. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. Um, we say that uh, solutions journalism can be applied to a wide range of topics, but it tends to work best for problems that are widely shared and widely acknowledged to be a problem. So over the shark attack, so I mean, we definitely do a solutions story about that, but not every I would say most cases, at least you know, around here, um, don't face this problem. And so it's not widely shared. And so the range of potential solutions is going to be um, more limited. We have this story about women who are waiting longer to have kids than in past years. Um, you know, there's a question as to whether or not some people might think that's a problem, and some people may not. And so it's not widely acknowledged as a problem, I might say. So um, based on those two sort of criteria, I definitely think the achievement gap story is the most conducive to a solution angle. Yeah. And this is a great segue into the next section, um, which will look at when, when is an appropriate time uh, to cover a solution story. When is the smartest time, I should say. Yeah. So when should I consider a solutions angle? Um, so we find that stories tend to follow more or less predictable patterns. Um, so when news breaks, we want to know the facts. We want to know what happened. We want to know, you know, the five W's. We want to know, um, you know, tell me what happened. Um, later, we we tend to see stories that are more contextual that will tell us a little bit more about the background to why something happened. We'll see analysis of, um, you know, the socioeconomic, you know, contributors to that problem. We'll start to see some deeper sort of in-depth analysis of, of that issue. News coverage often stops there, though. Um, and, and what we uh, propose is that uh, there's, there are there's another phase, right, where we can look at responses to those problems and we can potentially extend the life cycle of the story 
Um, because if we stop at creating awareness and outrage, and then even you know creating, even talking about context and background, we we are still leaving these profoundly important questions unanswered. And you'll see some of these on the screen. So what's being done about the problem? What can we learn from the successes, the failures, the experiments? Does the current coverage of the problem accurately reflect the full range of activity on the ground? And if there are noteworthy responses, what's preventing them from spreading? Um, so these are just a sample. Uh, there are a lot of questions that solutions journalism can help answer. And um, I think that too often, news coverage stops short of answering those questions. So when we think about the question, when should I consider a solutions angle, you know, we, we touched on this when I talked in the starter guide about, to, you know, um, making decisions about what kind of coverage is needed at a particular moment in time. This is, this is um, really what we're talking about here. It's thinking about, you know, what, what does the public most need at this moment in time? Is it awareness of the problem, in which case, um, you know, solutions journalism may not be appropriate. Solutions journalism is not going to be appropriate at, for every story. Um, so just having that, that, that awareness and, and looking at whether there's a gap in the public consciousness about what's being done to address the problem um, and, and, and tailoring your coverage to fill that gap. Um, so you know, an example of that, and we've, we've heard a lot, and I think I've mentioned this before, about, um, you know, we hear, we're hearing a lot about police shootings of African American men, and that's been a, an issue that has been uh, extensively covered. It's a really important issue. Um, and there's now, I think, uh, a lot of awareness about the, the magnitude of that problem. Um, what we know a lot less about is whether there's anything being done to address that or whether there's anywhere uh, in, you know, are there any places that are addressing that problem more effectively than others. And so there might be an opportunity there. Um, to, to do some solutions journalism. Now, Greg, I want to bring this back to you, actually, because there's a great example at the journal, um, Chronic Crisis, which is a series reported by Meg Kiss Kissinger, one of your reporters, and you were the editor, I believe? Correct. Yeah. So for everyone who doesn't know, it, it was a fantastic series. Um, it looked at the mental health system in Milwaukee, um, which had really been known more for emergency treatment as opposed to kind of preventive care. Uh, and so this, the series, it was a four part series and the first three parts looked at, looked at the problem because it wasn't well established. And so Meg went all around and really dug deep um, into how bad the problem was, established that. And then the fourth part came in and introduced uh, areas where, where, or cities rather that had effectively dealt with, um, similar problems. And she was looking at Iowa, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Houston, even went to Belgium to see to see how they tackle it differently. So I'd love to kind of pick your brain on how how you framed that and why you decided to add it as the fourth part of this series. And yeah, well, we um, so Meg Kissinger has covered mental health in Milwaukee for you know a decade plus, and she's got a whole roster of stories that highlighted huge problems of you know housing or um, at the mental health complex, you know, the county psychiatric hospital where if you, about five years ago we did a story on patients who were being, you know, raped and assaulted because there was lack of oversight and, you know, proper, you know, monitoring. So we've, she had an opportunity through a fellowship at Marquette University, the O'Brien uh, Public Service Fellowship, and she spent a year and we said, like, we really want to dig down to the very roots of the problem. And, she, and one of the things we did was look at how um, you know, she had anecdotally heard about how there's sort of this uh, revolving door quality to the mental health care. We were able through statistics and numbers to say, you know, here's, we got, you know, unique identifiers for patients, so privacy wasn't, you know, set that concern aside and, and found that people were just cycling through in an incredibly uh, high manner and very poor, you know, lack of efficient care uh, and getting worse and worse. So from there, we were able to keep digging and show you know where things were breaking down and, and having problems and from even from the beginning we we said like we want to make a difference on this issue not just to highlight a problem we want to point the city and community toward a solution so 
from the beginning, we're constantly asking, okay, so where where do they do that better? Um, you know, the questions that are on the screen now, I almost view them not as solutions questions as much as just basic questions you should ask. Um, you know, the, note, the, the one that really rings home on this project is if there are noteworthy responses, what is preventing them from spreading? And we've found that a great um, uh, example of a solution for police who were, you know, I guess we step back, part of the cycle was police would, you know, someone would reach psychiatric crisis, the police would be called, they would be hauled out to the ER, and then they would cycle back and just keep going. So we found that in Houston they have a much better system for, uh, you know, psychiatric uh, folks going out with the police to see what can be handled on the scene so there aren't cases of you know, we had people who were dying because they were dragged in uh, by the police and they were being mishandled in, in that manner. But we found that the person in Houston who created this program used to work in Milwaukee County. And it was sort of just startling to think, okay, well, why did, why did you not have success here, but you did there? And it kind of caused us to look at, you know, is there a, you know, a systemic thing going on here where the good ideas can't be replicated, they're not Know, funded, they're not you know adapted. We found another good example where on the juvenile side there's a very successful program called Wraparound, but right down the hallway where the uh, adult side of the psychiatric uh, care is, is handled, there is no such thing. So we have this model of a program for juveniles that we haven't even begun to replicate down the hallway. And so some of these examples you know really prompted uh, legislation in Madison and other changes here that took uh, the, some of the control of the mental health away from the elected officials and put it in the hands of a board of professionals. You know, some of the laws that were impediments to uh, allowing enough time for a full psychiatric evaluation were adapted. And it, it was something where we sort of set out from the beginning, so we want to, as I said before, not just report the problem, we're going to make a difference on the problem. We didn't know what, we weren't advocating a particular solution, we were just saying let's all get together and address this and by highlighting a whole menu of things that could be done I think it empowered the legislators and others to say okay let's let's do something, let's, this is our opportunity to step in and, and make some big changes. That's fascinating and that seems to be a commonality among editors of these really large investigative series that from the beginning they hope to have an impact. It's it's either been like a very chronic problem in the community for a long time and they're sick of the coverage and they it's not just they want to cover an issue or they want clicks, they want impact, they want things to change. That that's really a thread I see through all of these really large projects. And that's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, yeah what you said about uh, Go ahead. Yeah, I mean it definitely is a threat a main part of what we do here and it it goes back to in my worst case scenario is that there's just able to justify it to my bosses that if I had a reporter on a long range project and you get to the end and, and nothing came of it, they're like, well, why did we spend all this time on that project if we weren't, you know, going to have an impact or prompt people to be to you know to get engaged with the uh, the issue? So if you start building that in at the beginning, uh, it's you're going to have much more likelihood of success at the end. Definitely. Yeah, and there's been a lot of research. Just um, I know we've got a few minutes left, so but um, a lot of research to show that you know at, at a certain point people do um, tend to tune out of the news. So especially if we're covering these sort of really heavy, um, tough issues, um, and there's a lot of awareness and a lot of outrage. Um, at a certain point, continued coverage along those lines may not no longer be productive, and it may actually backfire and cause people to tune out. The solutions perspective can add a fresh angle to the story, and like I said, potentially extend sort of the the, that, the lifespan of that story, or or draw new audiences. You know, can also um, prevent that news fatigue from setting in. Definitely. Okay, we only have one more minute left, and for the participants who are left, um, curious to know what would be of most value to you as you try to implement solutions journalism in your newsroom, and click as many or as few as as may apply. To you. Um, these these things really help shape our our newsroom strategy and our network strategy, and determine what kind of resources we create. So. 
Um, definitely let us know if something isn't listed here. You can shoot me an email afterwards. It's Samantha at solutionsjournalism.org. And uh, let us know what you need, what will help you institute this kind of change. If you would like to bring us to your newsroom to do a, um, a workshop, uh, we'd be happy to, um, yeah, just anything. So let's see. Story ideas. And a workshop. Okay, we have a few who want a workshop and no project funding. Rika, we are expecting otherwise. We were wrong, yeah. Um, okay, that's great. Yeah, so really, if you have any um, specific challenges that you're dealing with, let us know. Um, and we're at about time, but I wanted to thank uh, Greg. Thank you so much for joining us. It was really great to have your, your input uh, and insights into this. And oh, you're welcome. And Rika as well. Thanks for this fantastic toolkit and, um, and joining us from California. All right, everyone. Uh, have a great day. Thanks, everyone.